Okay. So now I'm going to pass my necromancy hat. to the person that will introduce our speaker. Well, it's not a ready yet. Okay. A uh, hundred years ago, as of this year, uh, there was an astounding change in people's picture of how gravity worked. <clears throat> For a very long time, Newton's model of gravity had done a wonderful job of predicting the positions of the planets. It had been abundantly confirmed. Uh, but uh, Britain's leading astronomer at that time, Arthur Eddington, uh, wanted to test this new upstart theory, upstart model of gravity by Einstein. It was so strange that, to, it seemed so strange to people then, so different from what they were used to, that uh, most people didn't give it much thought. Uh, Einstein had predicted that sunlight uh, or starlight nearly grazing the sun on its way to us would be deflected by the sun's gravity. And he predicted the amount of the deflection as a uh, function of where the star was on the sky at the time. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Eddington and his team uh, went to tremendous effort to put together uh, expeditions to measure and see whether this was true. And uh, amazingly, they found that it was true. Uh, so this was really a startling development. And uh, today, we were very fortunate Success. to have Dean Howarth and Rachel O'Connell uh, to tell, to give us a hint of how strange it was. Uh, thank you. Oh, oh, yes. Also, someone had. No, that's Rupert. Okay. You can give me the necromancy hat back. <laughs> the wizard hat. I, I, I use it in graduation now. 2019 is the centennial of the proof of the general theory of relativity, Einstein's revolutionary theory of gravitation, a theory that still holds up to experimental scrutiny today, if I believe so. But like most scientific theories, gravity evolved under the stresses of skepticism and proof. It was built upon foundations laid earlier, like those of the late 17th century, um, codified by an eccentric scholar from Lincolnshire who became a knight of the realm and the most influential scientist in history. Like the theories of the ancient Aristotelian astronomers gave way to Galileo and Newton, Newton's would give way to Einstein. As we celebrate the anniversary of the famed expedition by Sir Arthur Eddington, we will speak with the man who actually redefined time itself by illustrating that it was not inexorable as once thought. It was fluid. The theories of relativity state that different people may experience different times, and not just in the colloquial manner of time flying while having fun, or the glacial passage of time a student might feel while sitting through a dreary lecture. <laughs> Time could, according to Professor Einstein, actually change and warp. Perhaps this fluidity of time is responsible for the glorious event that we are all about to experience here today. And the presence of this scientist who revised the clockwork universe of Isaac Newton, no offense, Mr. Newton, Albert Einstein. So, Shall we take this journey into time and space and hear how Professor Einstein unseated the heretofore master of gravity, Isaac Newton? Yes. Of course. Welcome, Herr Professor. As you may or may not be aware, your audience tonight is actually an assemblage of astronomers, or astronomers-to-be, hoping for you to shine some light on this intriguing topic, no pun intended. How delightfully appropriate for you to be here today. 
fact, it is uh, exceedingly appropriate to be speaking in front of some astronomers because it was, who better than to understand the, as light works, than astronomers themselves. And it was a pair of two eminent astronomers, one of them was British, one of them was American, who were directly instrumental in the events that transpired in 1919 that led to the general theory of relativity and how it was confirmed. Professor, the only lesson I recall about your theory is a limerick. It's actually called The Fast Girl. That sounds very promising. Quite so. I think it's amusing anyway. There was a young lady, Miss Bright, whose speed was faster than light. She went out one day in a relative way and came back the previous night. Wunderbar. <laughs> 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 I'm very impressed. <laughs> well, don't be, because I only vaguely remember something or other about Newton's falling apple otherwise. Oh, yes, I, Newton's theory of gravitation has, has been mentioned for successful for over 200 years. Uh, he explains the motions of falling apples, and orbiting moons, the tides, the way we sit in our seats, comets right. and the like. His theories even predicted the existence of a new planet. Neptune's existence, which was discovered in 1846, was testament to the power of Newtonian gravitation. Most impressive indeed. However, Newton's theories did not explain everything. Well, how is that? Well, you see, the very same astronomer who discovered mm -hmm. Neptune, a Frenchman named Le Verrier, was, discovered something anomalous with the orbit of Mercury. It had troubled astronomers for quite some time. It was a very small perturbation of its orbit. It could not be explained. Now, fairly noticeable for many years, and Isaac Newton could not explain this. People were alive, or people who propounded his theories. So Leveria actually postulated that the anomaly could be explained by the existence of a tiny planet within the orbit of Mercury, and being close to the sun, he dubbed it Vulcan. So the God of the volcano. Now, Le Verrier's success as an astronomer earned him much respect, and a great number of astronomers actually turned their telescopes to the skies in search of the planet Vulcan. But as would I if I had the interest. It was. Uh, nonetheless, even if you had looked at it, madam, it was never to be found. So, there was no Vulcan. Oh, and uh, this opened the door, so to speak. Well, that and my ruminations on Another very common experience that we can all understand for those of us who have taken physics in school or, or, or lived their lives would understand is that uh, apart from gravitation, there is also a very common phenomenon of acceleration. Now, I recall during one of my daydreaming sessions when I was working in Bern, the, the happiest thought of my life occurred to me. And it was a man falling from the roof does not feel his own weight. He feels <coughs> no gravity. But, Professor, that's hardly a happy circumstance. But it's not, fear, fear not, madam. This is only an imaginary experiment, a Duncan experiment. What I mean to say is if one is in free fall, they do not feel the force of gravity. Perhaps you felt this when you're going over a hill in a car, or riding on a roller coaster, or jumping into the pool. You feel this sense of weightlessness. Nonetheless, you are falling due to gravity. Now, the sensation would be precisely the same as if an astronaut were placed in a spaceship and put in the deepest parts of space, where they were far from any planet or any star, they would feel the same sense of weightlessness. However, if that box or spaceship that they were in was accelerated upward, they would feel their weight again. This is known as the principle of equivalence. So are you saying that if acceleration feels like gravity and gravity feels like acceleration, then perhaps they are one and the same? Yes, this is Poincare's uh, equivalence principle. Your, your grasp of physics is, is very good, my lady. Uh, I am certain it is more complicated than that. <laughs> well, what Newton thought of as a force of gravitation that we are familiar with, that you studied in school, re relied on two separate masses, and the law, the third law of action and reactions, if one mass attracts the other, the other attracts it in return. Now, what I saw this was something completely different. A warping of the Minkowski space-time continuum, 
When an apple falls to the earth, it is merely responding to a warped four-dimensional topography. Oh, obviously. <laughs> so, I apologize. <laughs> Let me explain this again. Perhaps you are a small child, and you have a pension for jelly beans. <coughs> yes? now, As do we all. Now, if you, this were your favorite candy of all time, perhaps you would save up all of your allowance and purchase as many jelly beans as you could. And you would pour them all over the surface of your bed and lay in them, the way a miser would lay in a pile of coins. Yes? Although unsanitary. Well, nonetheless, indulge me, please. Now, if this, what this boy would notice is as he laid on the bed, the jelly beans would collect around the outside of his body. And he might presume that there was some sort of jelly bean attraction between <laughs> him, himself, and his favorite candy. Now, and if he were a very smart boy, he could actually derive equations and empirical evidence that there was some sort of attraction between himself and jelly beans. <laughs> Alas, this is not a true representation of reality. The candies are simply responding to the curvature he has made in the bed. Well, why didn't you say that the first time, uh, Professor? Okay, let me show you an, an example. I have a piece of cloth here. Yes? Quite. And now, if one were to see how gravity would behave, simply waste, lay something very heavy in the center of it, and you can see how it makes a dent, yes? So perhaps gravity is not the attraction between two bodies, it is simply something rolling around in a hole made by something very large in the fabric of space. Such an audacious theory of yours must have required equally audacious proof. Also, of course, yes. Uh, and it was an arduous enterprise indeed. The mathematics of it were exceedingly difficult. Never in my life I had troubled myself over something so focused. Compared to this problem, the original theory of relativity from 1905 was mere child's play. Imagine trying to do geometry on graph paper. Imagine trying to do geometry at all. <laughs> <laughs> Once trying to do uh, geometry lessons on, on graph paper, and this graph paper not only is bendable and stretching, it can undulate at the same time. It would make your mathematical problems very difficult. Now, were it not for my lifelong <coughs> friend, uh, Marcel Grossman, uh, I remember that when we were in college together in, in Switzerland, he would uh, take notes in mathematics class when I would skip to go hiking and, and have sausages and coffee with my lady friend. I would then borrow his notes uh, to, to compensate for my, for my tardiness uh, or my truancy from school. And years later, it was his help as a fine mathematician that saved me again. However, a theory on paper is not enough. If one is to unseat the master Newton, there must be experimental evidence, yeah? And um, how does one go about proving such a thing? With the help of astronomers. Now, in 1913, I wrote a letter to the eminent American uh, astronomer from California, uh, George Ellery Hare. Now, he was at the Mount Wilson Observatory at the time, and I asked him if it would be possible to detect the curvature of space around the largest object in our vicinity, which is the sun. the sun, indeed. Now, my youthful infatuation with light would also figure into this experiment, because a beam of light would be, in essence, our jelly bean. Now, the light from a distant star would, be, would pass by the sun, and as it did so, it would be ever so slightly detected by the bulk of the sun. Now, now, how is this different? How could Isaac Newton not explain this? Well, a jelly bean and the sun have something in common. They both have a mass. But if a beam of light were to be deflected by the sun's gravity, this is a conundrum for, for Isaac Newton's equations because he requires both objects will have a mass. Light has zero mass. Ingenious, but how does one see starlight when the sun is in the sky? It would have to be daytime, correct? Us. Unless you can darken the sun. And does anyone have an idea how this could be done? That's an eclipse. eclipse. An eclipse of the sun, exactly. Now, what Hale responded to me in his letter was that this would be possible. One would 
Take photographs of the locations of stars in the sky and note where they are with great precision. And then wait for the sun to come nearby. Now, obviously, and as you And see if the light behind them moved. But during the day, you cannot see the stars. Right. Until, during a total eclipse, the sun, is, it's the majesty of the sun is blocked and veiled by the moon temporarily. And then, in that darkness, the astronomers could take the same pictures of the same stars and see if their locations had changed. Professor, you mentioned that the letter to Hale was in 1913. Uh, may I ask why it took until 1919 to execute this particular experiment? I know eclipses are rare, but they aren't that rare, are they? Well, uh, you bring up a very good point, and one that was very tragic. There was <laughs> Originally, this was planned to be executed in 1914. Uh, there was an astronomer from the Berlin Observatory, Erwin Freundlich, uh, who actually teamed with another American ext uh, astronomer named William Campbell, and they took it upon themselves to travel to see the eclipse in Russia. Unfortunately, it was only 20 days prior to the outbreak of the war. Now, when hostilities were rising, the Russian military was a bit uh, disconcerted by the fact that they were a uh, German man with strange equipment in Crimea. An understatement, <laughs> I and, suppose. And he was arrested, and his instruments were impounded. But Campbell, luckily, since America was still neutral in the war at the time, was released, but he had no use, he could not use uh, the, the fine instruments that had been impounded. And to further complicate the fact, when the eclipse, the eclipse did occur, it was a cloudy day, so <laughs> yeah. doubly unlucky. Campbell actually did take it upon himself when he returned to the United States in uh, June of 1818. So there was an eclipse that was visible from the West Coast in America, but unfortunately his fine instruments were still unavailable because they were uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. left in, in, in Russia at the time. So this was a, another setback. So this must have been especially disappointing considering your views and, and mine of the war. Perhaps it's all the more appropriate that an astronomer from Britain would embrace the theory of a German and thus prove that science can transcend nationalism. Uh, I know Arthur Eddington, a fellow pacifist, stepped into the fray at that point. Ah, is that sacred? Yeah, indeed. Uh, I believe. Um, yes, it, it has been arranged for us to see um, a summary of the experiment, correct? Oh, this is, is this possible? We have to ask the projectionist if you can supply this. I do not believe this requires the help of food, so we will be on. This was uh, from 1927. Let's wrap here. Oh, it's, it's come on now. Oh, great. Never mind. Yeah. yeah. I had brought my violin, you could have a soundtrack for this one. <laughs> that is an exaggeration of the 12 men. Anyone with an understanding of physics will understand this. <laughs> light approaches the sun, it will be deflected ever so slightly. Now, as you understand, we do not see light travel around corners. We only see light in straight lines. So 
we will see the star in a location that was somewhat displaced. Will probably be upset with so <laughs> this theory, the old theory. <laughs> Which is older than the new theory in any case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someday my theories will be replaced. I think that would suffice to have a projectionist to take the the film. I do believe that this was actually created by so the cartoonist who made Betty Boo. <laughs> Perhaps she should be included somehow in the in, in, in the story to liven it up a bit. But <laughs> cinema has progressed slightly since this point. Oh, really? So, uh, is Charlie Chaplin still popular? <laughs> to some people. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, as it should be. Um, returning to the 1919 editing, the Eddington expedition as charming as Chaplin and Betty Boop are, uh, there certainly was a great deal riding on it, wouldn't you say? Oh, so yes, it, it, it was no small undertaking. Uh, my theory made its way across Europe during the war, and it was actually passed through Holland, and eventually it made its, hand, its way to the hands of Arthur Eddington, who was the brilliant astronomer who was at the Royal Observatory. He convinced his superiors that this would be a very useful collaborative enterprise for the betterment of all science. Now, it was then decided that in the next eclipse that would be happening in 1919, that there would be two separate expeditions. One would be sent to uh, a town on the coast of Brazil named Sobral, and then there was another along the path of totality on the other side of the Atlantic, off an island off the coast of Africa named Principe. Now, the hope was that the shadow of the sun would pass across South America, across the ocean, and then into Africa. And having two separate opportunities to observe would increase the chances of making this observation well. Now, the, the days that came prior to this, uh, with very exquisite precision, the astronomers took it upon themselves to, to take pictures of the sky, and the stars were located in the Hyades cluster, I believe, which is, which is near Taurus and the true positions of these stars was noted. Mm. Now, and then on the day, amidst great tension because of the devilish weather in both places, on May 29th, a series of photographs were taken during a fleeting seven minutes of totality. And so oh, that uh, caused the crown to fall from Newton's head, well, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't that simple, no. It was, it took much longer than that, you see. It took nearly six months for the data to be collected and analyzed by the community of scientists. But the results at last were announced in November of 1919, and the photographic plates showed that there was a predicted shift of 1.7 seconds of arc. Is that a lot? No, no it, it is very small. The distance would be equivalent to perhaps looking at the width of a coin at a distance of two kilometers. But with that small difference, 
came with very large consequences. Oh, I should say so. Your name was splashed across newspapers and telegraph lines all over the world. Listen to what the New York Times said. Lights all askew in the heavens. Men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. Einstein's theory triumphs. Revolution in science, read another. New theory of the universe, Newtonian ideas overthrown. Another said, uh, I believe it was in the video, no more than 12 men in the world can understand it. <clears throat> and Nobel laureate George Bernard Shaw called you a maker of universes. No small compliment there, Professor. Yes. So notoriety was astonishing. I felt like a pagan idol. His fame, I think that I have become more and more stupid, which is a commonplace phenomenon. I even penned a little poem for it on one occasion. Oh, did you? I think all the astronomers would love to hear it. If you will indulge me. <clears throat> wherever I go and wherever I stay, there is always a picture of me on display. On top of a desk, or out in the hall, tied around the neck, or hung on the wall. Women and men, they play a strange game, asking, beseech me, please sign me your name. From the erudite fellow, a brook not a quibble, but firmly insist on his piece of scribble. Sometimes surrounded by all this good cheer, I'm puzzled by some of the things that I hear, and wonder my mind for a moment not hazy if I and not they could really be crazy. <laughs> Professor, well done. It is true. I recall that when I lived in Prague, there was a stain asylum across the street, and I often lamented that the only difference between the lunatics inside the insane asylum was that they was a madman who did not think about physics, and I was the madman who did. But here's a question: What would you have done if the English expedition had failed? Oh, I would feel sorry for the dear Lord, for the silly. <laughs> Had to be correct. I admire your confidence, Professor. Well, it simply comes from the beauty that I see in the cosmos and its mysterious workings. I have no special talents. I simply never lost my childlike curiosity. So, advice for those of you, Kim.Dr. Do not grow old. No matter how long you live, never cease to stand like curious children before the great mysteries. Which, into which we were all born. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, future astronomers, perhaps we should conclude on that note. Uh, time certainly has flown by, and uh, Professor, you probably have a theory about that as well, don't you? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, perhaps that'll be a subject of another talk in the evening when we have more time. But mm -hmm. suffice it to say, when it comes to the passing of time, when one sits his hand on the hot stove for a minute it feels like an hour. But when one sits next to a pretty girl, it seems the hour seems only like a minute. And this is relativity. Well, thank you for your insights and expertise, Professor. Well, to punish me for my contempt of authority, uh, it seems like fate has made me one myself, but I, uh, I hope that I have uh, answered your questions. And perhaps I can answer any questions that some of you in the audience might have. I'm very interested to find out if anything has developed since the time since 1919. Anyone? Yes, sir? Have there been other eclipses after that where people have done similar experiments to verify the one from 1919? Yes, indeed there have been. And I'll take that there have been another aspect of my theory which <coughs> I'm interested to find out if there has been, uh, if plans have been made to test it. The fact that uh, my associate mentions that time is also relative. And there is an aspect of the theory of gravitation that says that gravity also affects time. But we could not test this theory firsthand, and I am curious to find out if indeed this has come to pass. Yes, yes it, has. it has. And how was this, how was this tested? The first measurement was they took two uh, very precise atomic clocks, one in the basement and one in the top of a high building, and watched as 
the one ran, ran faster and than the, the other. And the one that was closer to the ground ran slower. Yes. So right now, young lady, your feet are aging more slowly than <laughs> your head. <laughs> oh, yes. So not much. Well, now, now, now <coughs> well, and perhaps this has some practical everyday applications, because in the time, there were arguments in my day that this was all flights of fancy, yes? yes? Satellites only clocks. Marvelous. Uh, and Isaac Newton would be happy that there are satellites as well. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> Yes, sir. The whole GPS system would break down in 24 hours without relativistic corrections. And see, for, for those who insist that science <laughs> only needs to be for practical purposes, if that were the case in my day, I would have given up long ago. But eventually, your theories come to fruition, and just like the apple on Newton's tree, they ripen to benefit those in the future. So it's rather fascinating. But there was some also talk about dark, gravitationally collapsed stars at the time, which I was rather dubious about. Have you heard of these things? No, no? Like all, yeah. Interesting time. I, I remember the, 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 the calculation said that these things were possible, but I thought they were far too exotic to be real. So perhaps they have indeed been discovered? I but that is, that warms my heart, young man. Absolutely, that is one. Wunderbar, as we say in German. So, fantastic. Well, if I have exhausted all of your questions, we will be happy to yield the floor to the next speaker. I believe we are here to pay attention to the accomplishments of these uh, fine young astronomers, yes? yes. <laughs>